the um, <clears throat> U.S. proposed missile defense uh, for Europe uh, is, of course, a front burner issue right now. Uh, the, the president has made it clear from public statements that he sees the uh, putting in place these components for this European missile defense system as, as a major uh, accomplishment that he wants to leave as part of his legacy. And uh, it has been getting a very high level of attention, not only from the uh, Bush administration itself, but also uh, from the European governments, uh, particularly the NATO, uh, the NATO allies, uh, and also uh, from the uh, Russian Federation, which has uh, been uh, very unhappy uh, with claims made by the United States. Um, in uh, earlier work uh, I published uh, in, uh, in an Arms Control Today article, I talked about certain claims about interceptors that uh, were made by uh, the U.S. government, in particular the Missile Defense Agency, that uh, are clearly false uh, in that, um, in theory, uh, these interceptors, along with the, the, the locations of the interceptor site, and this uh, a radar, which I'll describe to you, that is supposed to go, uh, uh, supposed to be located in the Czech Republic, uh, could in theory, in combination, uh, actually engage Russian ballistic missiles launched from the western part of, um, uh, of Russia. And uh, this is a big issue because uh, this, this capability, which uh, is small now, has the potential to look very large in the future if you see the current system as the leading edge of something much bigger, which certainly Russian military planners and political leaders have to consider as a possibility. I'm actually not going to talk about that issue here, although I have appendix slides uh, that, uh, that, uh, that could, you know, could allow me to get to it if we have time in a, in a question and answer period, should there be interest. Um, my colleague, George Lewis, who's at Cornell, uh, and I have been working uh, very hard on trying to understand this system in greater detail because there are congressional hearings coming up where this is going to be uh, a subject of some considerable uh, interest on the part of the Congress. And also, we are about to publish uh, a centerpiece article on this in the uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists um, May-June issue. So, so we've been working pretty hard. And um, one of the problems uh, I've discovered uh, talking about this problem, which I'm still actively engaged in analyzing, is that um, when you start looking deeper and deeper into this system, you have a more and more difficult time finding something that is claimed about the system by official people that actually turns out to be true. Uh, this is a really, uh, it's, it's a disturbing situation in my view, from a political perspective, because uh, I think it's very clear that the United States is actively misinforming NATO allies about the capabilities of this system. And so what I'd like to do in this talk is describe the system to you first, and uh, hopefully in a way that engages your interest without overwhelming you with technical details. I used to, uh, as you'll see, I'm, I'm very big into uh, pictures, and I, I don't mean uh, blocks of color, I mean real pictures that illustrate what I'm trying to explain. Uh, hopefully I will be able to give you a sense of the technical issues that are uh, serious from the point of view of uh, potential political consequences, as well as in terms of uh, potential national security uh, consequences, because after all, uh, if you just approach this thing as neutral as you can possibly be, and you ask yourself, is this a defensive system that can provide some military utility? Uh, if the answer is absolutely no, and the technical foundations for reaching that conclusion are pretty unambiguous, as I'll show you they are, uh, then uh, there's a lot of reason for concern about the management of the overall national security process uh, in the country. But um, uh, those of you who have followed other national security issues, I'm sure, will not be totally surprised by this particular one, although it's not as evident as, uh, as things like the Iraq War have become. 
Um, let me start by giving you a description of what the U.S. Missile Defense Agency would tell you uh, about um, how this proposed missile defense system will work. And I'll describe uh, shortly thereafter uh, how it might actually work or how the components might actually perform. Um, this slide I intentionally chose because this is a briefing uh, by, um, in June of 07. I have other briefings by the director of the Missile Defense Agency where um, they are briefing high-level panels. In this case, the European Union Committee on Foreign Affairs, the Subcommittee on Security and Defense, uh, where all of this information uh, I'm getting, uh, you know, I'm giving to you about the Missile Defense Agency's uh, discussions are derived from briefings of this kind to major players uh, who are NATO allies. So, so bear in mind that what I'm describing to you is what has been told uh, to, our, uh, to our allies who are being asked to allow these systems to be in place on European soil. The Czech, of course, the Czech Republic, the Poles, uh, as well as uh, the Western European allies. Uh, this complicated slide is uh, going to be something that I deconstruct for you uh, because it's so complicated. But this is basically uh, sh uh, showing you how this system is supposed to work uh, according to uh, the Missile Defense Agency. I just show it to you again simply because it's an official document of the Missile Defense Agency. So let's use that slide to get a grasp, uh, uh, deconstructing it and then reconstructing it piece by piece to describe how this system works according to uh, the Missile Defense Agency. Here again is a slide just to remind you what it's talking about. The blue is a surveillance radar uh, fan uh, uh, from Filingsdale, uh, Radar Filingsdale, uh, England. Uh, the green is a, a radar fan uh, associated with the uh, what's called the X-band European mid-course radar or EMR radar that's uh, to be placed uh, when a treaty is finalized with the Czech Republic uh, near, near uh, Prague. And then this is a fan here, which is not easily evident, of what's called the forward-based X-band radar, which incidentally looks like in this slide it's in, um, it's in the Republic of Georgia, which uh, is quite close to Russia. And uh, the Russians have had some comments about the possibility that a radar could be placed that close to them. Um, again, de uh, deconstructing the slide, uh, let me just show you what the major components of the system are. Uh, there's a large early warning radar. I'll show you pictures of it. This radar looks very much like, uh, in fact, it is the same kind of radar as is deployed uh, in, uh, uh, by the United States for its early warning systems. We have uh, an early warning radar like this in clear Alaska. Uh, we have another in uh, Thule, Greenland. Uh, we have another in, uh, uh, in, in Cape Cod, uh, Massachusetts, uh, and uh, one at Beale Air Force Base in California. And these radars provide us with early warning of uh, ballistic missile attack against the United States. So they're not designed initially for uh, ballistic missile defense. They're basically designed to tell you that something bad might be happening so that certain measures you might take uh, uh, other than defense, can be carried out to give you some idea of what is happening if the United States is under attack by ballistic missiles. That's the purpose of an early warning radar. It's not designed to survive or function in a countermeasure environment that would be created by a resourceful attacker if this particular radar were being used as part of a missile defense. So the radar can track objects uh, rather impressively in, a, in what I would call a benign environment. But if this radar is then integrated into a missile defense, uh, it's reasonable to expect an adversary who has the capability to attack you with ballistic missiles might employ countermeasures. And in fact, what I'll talk about later in this talk is a CIA national intelligence estimate that actually delineates a set of countermeasures that are expected, according to the national intelligence estimate, to be flown on the first primitive ballistic missile that we see, long-range ICBM that we see. Uh, I, won't, uh, I have slides that we'll probably not get a chance to go into, but I, for those of you who are interested, I'd be happy to talk with you offline or by email. Um, when you analyze 
the, um, the countermeasures that the CIA National Intelligence Estimate states would be flown on the earliest ballistic missile tests. In this case, uh, we're talking about Iran uh, deploying uh, an ICBM according to uh, the concerns of the Missile Defense Agency and the uh, White House. Um, the, these countermeasures, we should expect them to be present. And when you analyze these countermeasures, as the capabilities of these countermeasures against the technology in this missile defense and the vastly upgraded versions of this missile defense, the first time this missile flies, the missile defense and its upgraded version will be rendered obsolete. So this is an important issue. Uh, this incidentally, this NIE, this National Intelligence Estimate, came out in 1999 and disappeared once the Bush administration took uh, office. Uh, there is an interesting issue that needs to be looked into by the Congress, I hope, to understand why this very important finding uh, has disappeared from uh, national, subsequent national intelligence estimates. All right, then you have this European mid-course radar. This radar is known, uh, I'll, I'll explain the jargon very shortly, as an X-band radar. Uh, basically, this radar operates at a frequency that's roughly 20 times higher than, than this uh, Filingsdale radar. I have some simple slides to illustrate why that's important. And, um, and its purpose is to get very high resolution to try to see if you can see features of warheads and decoys that would allow you to tell whether the radar is looking at a warhead or decoy. Uh, nobody disputes the, that the, the early warning radars are incapable of this function. There's, there's not a debate on that at all. Uh, the Missile Defense Agency claims that this radar can do the job. There is substantial reason to debate that, but I'm not going to get into that in too much detail here. But again, if there's anybody with a serious interest in this, I'll be more than happy to discuss it in further detail. But this is the purpose of this radar is to provide discrimination. Now, let me give you a, sen a sense of why discrimination is so important. If I have a warhead that's two meters long, and a strand of wire that's two feet, well, no, one foot long, one third of a meter long, uh, they will both create a radar target for this UHF radar that's indistinguishable from each other. So you must have high resolution, uh, a high resolution radar operating at these much higher frequencies to at least be able to see that one object is somewhat extended and the other object is sort of a, a wire in space. If you don't have that capability, you can deploy millions of these wires per, per pound of material. Because today, uh, you can have these glass fibers that, you, uh, that are, have aluminum uh, evaporated onto them. They're very light. And uh, typically, a million dipoles of this kind per pound, or half a million per pound, or, or just sort of a standard uh, capability off the shelf. So, so this radar is not going to be able to do anything but track objects. So you must have this radar to tell whether you're looking at a strand of wire or whether you're looking at a warhead. Uh, in, in northern Poland, there will be an ICB, a, 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 a missile, uh, an interceptor field deployed. The interceptor field is advertised as 10 interceptors. Um, and the, the argument then goes that this is not a threat to Russia or anybody else because the number of interceptors are too small. Uh, this raises problems of uh, internal logic uh, with regard to the Missile Defense's claims, Let, Missile Defense uh, um, Agency's claims. Let me just go through the internal logic. I'm not uh, ascribing to this logic. I'm just trying to point out the apparent inconsistencies in, in the claims made by the uh, U.S. government at this time. Uh, the, the, the concern is that there is a, a, an Iranian ballistic missile program and this program is so well funded, uh, not only well funded with money, but with engineers and scientists and industrial commitment that uh, these, uh, these people could produce an ICBM by somewhere around 2015. Uh, I won't go into the details here. That's another talk. Uh, there's no reason to believe that this is a correct assessment, but let me just accept it and go on. So we have this violent, capable, uh, industrial, emerging industrial power, able to build, uh, you know, put together an ICBM program in this dramatically short period of time, and uh, they're only going to produce one ICBM. 
In other words, they're going to build us gigantic facilities to produce ICBMs because these are specialized facilities you need just to be able to construct the components for the ICBM and assemble it and make it, uh, you know, bring, bring it up to a functional state. But you're not going to have a production line. Well, that's crazy. You are going to have, I mean, again, if we take their argument, you can expect a production line. And so after you see one ICBM, you're going to see two, and you're going to see three, and five, and ten, and so on. So the idea that you would uh, claim that you're going to have a site to deal with this threat that you have defined, not me, uh, and it's going to be, you're never going to expand it beyond ten interceptors, just flies in the face of the logic that uh, you're trying to uh, claim you're using. So, uh, so there's a problem there, and I'll show you a little bit about that. And then there's this forward-based, uh, you'll see it as the, uh, uh, the FBX in, is the acronym, forward-based X-band radar, which is a much smaller radar that would be forward deployed. It looks like in Georgia, but um, uh, the Russians have been growling about that, and it's not clear that this thing will get deployed uh, in Georgia. My guess is if it gets deployed, it will wind up in eastern Turkey or someplace like that. Um, but who knows? Um, this is just to give you a sense of how these different radars uh, look, uh, just as boxes. I'll show you actual photographs of them later. This is the upgraded uh, early warning radar relative to the forward-based X-band radar. The, these are scaled intentionally. It's in a block diagram so that it's easy for you, you know, to quickly comprehend the situation. And this shows you the wavelength of the uh, uh, radio waves emitted from this large radar relative to the small ones. The, the, the important point to, to, to get out of this diagram is that the large radar has very long wavelength uh, radio emissions, which means it has no resolution, uh, but, uh, uh, but it has a lot of power. And so it can, it can potentially observe objects at very long range. And the smaller radar has very short wavelength uh, um, radio uh, signals, which are of much lower power, but potentially can do high resolution work. So the way these radars are going to work together is you're going to have a radar that's big, scanning the sky, finding objects, and then it's going to tell the smaller X-band radar, look at this one, look at this one, look at this one, because this radar does not have the ability to searchlight scan uh, large areas of sky. Uh, just another technical fact that <clears throat> is quite relevant, is that if you think of the back area of this, the size of this warhead uh, in this diagram as symbolizing the effect of uh, what's called radar cross-section, the effect of area associated with scattering a signal uh, from a warhead back to the radar. And radar cross-section is literally typically in square meters. You, know, it's, you typically sight a radar warhead. A uh, radar, uh, radar cross-section is, is square meters in terms of square meters. The, um, at long wavelengths, at lower frequencies, the reflectivity of a warhead is, um, is typically uh, 20 or 30 or more times larger than the same warhead reflection uh, at short frequencies. Let's, it's a, there's an issue of electromagnetism here. It's straightforward to describe, but we don't have a lot of time. The important thing is to just know this fact. So not only does the smaller radar have a lot less power when it's looking for the warhead, the warhead is a much more difficult object to see because it reflects less radio signal at these frequencies. And here in this diagram, I've now added the, uh, the uh, uh, European mid-course radar, again, scale to size so that you can compare these three radars, because we'll be talking about them. And its real size, the real size of the radar antenna, is smaller, because this is what's called a, thin, uh, a, thin, uh, it's a thinly populated phased array radar. Again, that's a lot of jargon. But basically, it's, not a, uh, it's designed to give you a very narrow beam, but it doesn't have uh, all the extra power that you would expect if you looked at the full face of this radar. It could be upgraded but uh, not the system they're, they're, calling about, they're talking about putting in. So here again is the system. The European mid-course radar is here. That's X-band. Uh, there's the, um, uh, the Filingsdale radar, which is 
uh, ultra high frequency, so it's uh, no resolution but can see things at long range. The missile defense field and the X-band transportable radar, which is much less powerful than even the, uh, the EMR, but it's up close. So it can do things uh, to help you. This is the radar fans for the transportable X-band radar and for the uh, European mid-course radar as defined in the original diagram I showed you. This is, what the mid, this is what the Missile Defense Agency says the radar can do. And then, of course, we have the fan uh, for the uh, uh, Filingsdale radar. And what the Filingsdale radar is doing is it's working hand-in-hand -hand with the European mid-course radar. It's finding objects. The mid-course radar is, is pointing at them and looking at them. Uh, and, uh, and so together, these things uh, have some role uh, working together to identify warheads so that interceptors can be later launched at them. So here's an example. Later on, uh, the, uh, an interceptor is launched. The interceptor flies out. It deploys what's called a kill vehicle. I'll show you some pictures of these again to put a little meat on this. And the kill vehicle you see is pointed in this funny direction because it's looking at the warhead and they're coming together uh, where there's going to be an intercept uh, at this location in the cartoon. Uh, the, so we have the transportable X-band radar initially picking up the, the, uh, the, in, the, the launch of this rocket from Iran. Uh, it starts out that we, we have satellites deep in space uh, in, in uh, 40,000 kilometers altitude, so way up in space. It can see the rocket plume from the, inter from the uh, ballistic missile when it's launched. It can observe the, the ballistic missile for maybe four minutes of its powered flight out of five minutes. It can give rough queuing information to tell this radar where to look for the launched missile, which helps this radar a lot because it's got very limited capability. It can't search large areas of sky. This can provide additional, more accurate tracking information to hand that information over to this radar, which can then acquire uh, the, uh, the warhead uh, or the complex of objects. And then we have the surveillance radar helping to identify things and find things to examine and look at. So, so a pretty complex operation all around, and then of course the, the, the intercept, uh, the attempt to intercept. If you're talking about defending Europe, it's the same process. I won't go through the same agonizing detail, but basically what's happening is uh, the same process happens, but the targets are at shorter range, and the missiles have different flight trajectories. All right, so now let's ask the question, how does the system really work? I mean, it seems very straightforward what I described to you. In fact, if you were looking at this, as I looked at it when I first looked at it, whether I agreed that the system that they could implement it or not, you know, I just assumed that yeah, well, it's it's pretty clear what the system does. Well, here is um, uh, here is these are calculations we have done showing the range of the European mid-course radar uh, to uh, detect and track. A warhead, in this case, it has a radar cross section of one square meter. I'll explain what this means very shortly. So, th this, is the, the, this is an important set of apparently silly technical details. Uh, so, so, the radar cross section of the objects were or one square meter, because it's such a good reflector of radio signal, the X band radar can see it at 2,100 kilometers range or more, roughly. And, and this is the range of the fan shown. These are trajectories that are actual ballistic trajectories. So these are physical trajectories that I have calculated using Kepler's equations, for those of you who know what that means. Uh, and and these, are, these are the ground tracks, which I've intentionally put in. And there was a shadow of, uh, of these trajectories on the ground. The reason for putting that in is you can see it's very deceptive. You, the ground track here passes uh, in the range of the radar, but um, uh, but, but the actual object in space is very high up. So it's, you can see right away, if you realize that this radar has a, has a search volume that could look roughly like a, a hemisphere, uh, that this might not be trackable under these conditions. All right, let me give you a, a, an important fact 
that there's no reason that any non-specialist should, should, should know. Uh, although there's every reason for the director of the Missile Defense Agency and his uh, supposed technical staff to know well. Uh, if you look at actual radar cross-sections of warheads, they have this funny shape. Warheads tend to be cone-shaped objects. Now, bear in mind that a cone-shaped, if you think of a cone-shaped object as in a simple-minded but still useful conceptual way, as a mirror. It's a shiny mirror that I'm shining light off. And my radar is the light source. Uh, the, the object is not going to reflect a lot of the light back to the radar as it would, if, for example, if it was a, a mirror perpendicular to me, I get a blinding light back. But because all of the surfaces, or most of the surfaces, are basically at an angle that causes the light to be reflected away rather than back to the radar, its effective area, reflecting area from the point of view of signal reflected back to me, is quite small. And it turns out that for a typical standard run-of-the-mill warhead, so we're not talking about anything fancy. We're talking about something that's a warhead that's designed by anybody who can build ICBMs and warheads. Um, the actual radar cross-section will be about um, uh, 10 times smaller. Uh, in fact, um, I'm sorry, 100 times smaller. Um, at X-Band, in fact, this radar cross-section is 10 times larger than a, a locust, a large insect. So in terms of reflecting back radiation. So it's, it's, it's a hundredth of a square meter. A locust might be a thousandth of a square meter. So not one square meter, but a uh, but hundred times smaller. If, as I'll show you later, if I orient the, the, the warhead, because they're different orientations, by orienting it slightly in space, uh, then it can reflect uh, much less signal. By carefully choosing its orientation, uh, I can get the, re the, the reflected signal back to well under one thousandth of a square meter. So now, when we look at this national intelligence estimate, and the national intelligence estimate just makes these flat statements. It doesn't, say, it doesn't expand on it at all. So you need, you need the information of a tech, from a technical expert to understand what this means. The national intelligence estimate says, well, countermeasures that we expect to see are, first of all, they're going to separate the warhead from the upper rocket stage. Well, that means the upper rocket stage has a relatively large radar cross-section, so you could track the upper rocket stage, but if you separate the warhead, it's got a much smaller uh, radar reflectivity. We're also going to see spin-stabilized warheads, the earliest ICBMs. That is to say, you spin the warhead up so it doesn't tumble end over end, or so you can control its orientation. And we're also going to see the ability to control the orientation of the warhead. Now, this is not me saying this. This is the CIA National Intelligence Estimate of 1999. Well, what could this mean? Uh, sorry about the uh, complex-looking slide. This is a three-meter-long warhead. I, I want to. This is out of a, a symposium. Th this diagram is out of a symposium that was run and the research was funded by the Missile Defense Agency. So this is their work. Um, uh, in this case, it's competently done. And um, so this is a very large warhead, three meters long. And if you look at it from the front end, it's going to be um, a few hundredths of a square meter in radar reflection. If you look at it at a 45 degrees angle, so I've oriented this thing, it's going to have a radar uh, cross-section of about three thousandths of a square meter. If you, if you turn it over and you're looking at it from, from this side, from this angle, uh, for example, so it's, you've intentionally turned it over in that or, into this orientation, it's going to look a thousandths or even lower of a square meter in radar uh, <coughs> reflectivity. Let me show you what that means. If, if the radar cross-section of the uh, warheads are one hundredth of a square meter. So the enemy has done nothing except to basically prevent the warhead from tumbling. Um, uh, the same exact radar with all the properties that, uh, nothing, none of its properties changed except for the fact that the target reflects less radio signal is going to have a range shown here of uh, maybe 600, 650 kilometers. Well, this is not going to be enough to do any discrimination. The fans that these guys were showing 
uh, were, were a couple of thousand, were more than 2,000 kilometers in range, maybe 2,500 kilometers in range. You don't have that capability with this radar. Why would you put it in? Uh, good question. Um, let me just venture a guess uh, as a person who has, uh, using my bureaucrat's nose, as I used to describe it in the Pentagon. Um, if, if these calculations are correct, and they are, they're basic radar calculations. They're, in fact, they're very optimistic. This overstates the capability. We gave this radar every capability that you could imagine. Um, probably the reason that this facility is being put into the Czech Republic now is because there are secret plans to upgrade it later. I'll explain a little bit more about its function shortly. But Oh, this one's going to Washington, D.C., so I know that you won't be upset about that. And, and, uh, and this one's going to Seattle. And, and, the, and, the, and the, the, that small uh, circle intersects the ground track, does that mean that it can, it, it, it can deal with the one? No, it can't, because it turns out, I'll show you later, that this is a, if you think of this as a hemisphere, I just laid it out because it's easier to see. Uh, in fact, if you're flying to Washington, D.C., and, and you have this radar range, you couldn't use the radar for anything even then, because you'd overfly the radar at a range too large for it to, in, to even do any tracking or, or discrimination. If the radar cross-section is a thousandth of a square meter, which could be achieved by simply turning the warhead a few tens of degrees oriented in space, assuming you have that technical capability. You spun up the warhead, you orient it in space, and you spun it up so it's stable in that direction. Uh, this is the radar range uh, you might achieve against that warhead. So uh, what you basically have is these three possibilities based on the size of the radar cross-section. Um, I'm hoping that someone in the Congress is going to look at this stuff when we publish it and ask why all these differences and what is the Missile Defense Agency assuming when they publish these radar fans. All right, let me show you a few of what these actual components look like, just so they're not just black boxes. This is the early warning radar. Uh, it's any early warning radar. It's any of these. Uh, I don't even know which one this is, uh, whether it's uh, in England or someplace in the United States. It's, uh, it's got a very uh, large size. I, I always like to put six-foot men. I have a little icon that I always put in every diagram uh, to give you a sense of size. Here is the... Uh, the European mid-course radar, you can see it's a lot smaller. Uh, uh, not as powerful, a lot smaller, and it's looking for an object that is hundreds of times less uh, visible. So it's got a lot of disadvantages relative to this big early warning radar. Here's the six-foot man in that case. All of these are scaled to, to the same size. And this is the forward-based X-band radar. And you can see uh, soldiers here. And here, this is just a close-up of it. And, uh, it's a very capable radar for its size, uh, but basically um, uh, it can perform marginally, maybe, under very optimistic conditions and only because it's very close uh, to the actual um, site. All right, let me just show you what the interceptors look like. The interceptors look like an ICBM. They're big, intercontinental ballistic missile. Here is uh, just a photograph. I, I couldn't get a good resolution photograph of this, but this is nice because it's got a lot of people give you a sense of size. And if I take this and I place this next to a Minuteman, this is an ICBM that can carry uh, 2,500 pounds of, of uh, payload uh, to a range of 10,000 kilometers, and I take the rocket properties. This rocket, pro the properties of this rocket are known. The reason these properties of this rocket are known is it's derived from a set of launch vehicles. Those, if you have some aeronautical uh, space people here, it's the Pegasus, Taurus, Minotaur series of launch vehicles. These rocket stages are all derived from Minuteman and been modernized and for commercial launch vehicles. And so we know the properties of this rocket. And this should be able to carry 1,500 pounds, so, so um, three-fifths of the um, uh, payload of a, of a Minuteman to 10,000 kilometers range, if, if it were used as an ICBM. I'm not saying it's used as. It's a big rocket with a lot of capability. The reason I'm dwelling on, this, on the capability of this rocket is 
to carry 1,500 pounds to, uh, uh, to 10,000 kilometers range, um, the rocket has to achieve a speed of well over seven, slightly over seven kilometers per second at burnout. The Missile Defense Agency wants you, or particularly the Russians, to believe that this missile carrying 60 pounds of payload, uh, 120 pounds of payload, rather than 1,500 pounds of payload, can only achieve a burnout speed of 6.3 kilometers per second. Now, if you believe that, I got a bridge to sell you, because uh, I, one, the question is, where, where are the lead bricks in, the, in this interceptor? Because if it's built using technology that the Pegasus, uh, that are used in the Pegasus a commercial launch vehicle, then it's impossible to see. In fact, we, we have a range of calculations. And the reason this number of uh, 6.3 kilometers per second is important is this is the speed that makes it impossible, at least in, in theory, for uh, such an interceptor to overtake a, a Russian ICBM and, and, and attack it um, if it's flying toward the United States. So they mandated the speed to 6.3 kilometers per second, even though their own numbers, which I have sets of because I asked the Associated Press reporter who wrote a detailed article on this, to ask for these specific numbers. When we calculate uh, what the speed of this interceptor should be, it should be somewhere between 8.5 and, and 9 kilometers per second, not 6.3 kilometers. It's not even close. So where these differences come from is something I hope maybe the Congress will look into. Um, all right, let me just show you the kill vehicle. The kill vehicle is this uh, sort of object that is mounted on top, I'm sorry, uh, is mounted on top of the, um, of the rocket. And this is basically a telescope. It's got rocket motors. You can see here's a rocket exhaust uh, rocket motor, another rocket motor. Uh, that's probably a fuel tank. The larger tank is probably an oxidizer tank. And uh, so basically what happens is the, uh, the rocket launches the kill vehicle to 8.5 kilometers per second, say, not 6.3. And now the kill vehicle is hurtling along at this very high speed. And it has these rocket motors that are perpendicular to it that can slightly adjust its trajectory by at most a kilometer per second, but probably less than that. So it really can't change course in a large way, but it can adjust where it's going. And 60 seconds, let's say, let's imagine 60 seconds before it's going to encounter the objects it's going to, one of which it's going to try to intercept, uh, it opens its eyes. And when it opens its eyes, 60 seconds before encountering the object, it's 600 to 900 kilometers away because the closing speeds are so high. So, so it has, and it can, incidentally, the technology and in infrared sensors is there. It's really a very uh, impressive uh, capabilities. I'm not going to. So um, here's an example of what, um, uh, of what these objects look like at a range of about 250 kilometers. Um, this, is actual, this is an actual image that was provided by the Missile Defense Agency uh, after the uh, integrated flight test six. So this is their image of what they saw. And uh, this is a large balloon, 2.2 meter diameter balloon, which we know is about seven to ten times brighter uh, than the um, uh, than the warhead, which is this object here, and uh, and then there's a rocket stage that deploys the warhead uh, and the balloon uh, that is um, um, in the field of view. So there are three objects, and basically, uh, what we now know is the situation is that these three objects are uh, observed. Uh, the brightness of each of these objects is, is seen. It, they know in advance that the warhead is the least bright of the three objects, and they home on the least bright of the three objects. Now, why home on the least bright of the three objects? You have to be told in advance what, which object is going to be. It's going to be the brightest object, the least bright of the object. In other words, there's no way from physics to determine what the warhead is going to look like uh, unless somebody tells you what it's going to look like. So it's, think of it as... Uh, the three suitcases in front of me, one is red, one is green, one is blue. I can see them, but I'm told in advance the blue suitcase is the one I have to go after. If I'm not told the blue suitcase is the one I have to go after, I have no way of knowing which suitcase contains the bomb. So, 
All right. Uh, let's take a look at the interceptors requirements. Um, the way to look at the interceptor farm that would be placed in Poland is that it's really part of this integrated missile defense that the U.S. is building to defend the continental United States. So uh, there's one up at Fort Greeley in, uh, uh, in uh, Alaska, uh, an interceptor farm, and they want to put this other interceptor farm not in uh, Maine, which people were originally talking about and said not only no, but hell no. They're going to put it in Poland. And um, Maine turned it down? what? Uh, I don't know if they actually. Uh, there was a lot of discussion, and uh, you know, uh, I think they. I, I don't know the details, but uh, I think they would have. They were talking about putting in Maine, and then they stopped talking about it. So I assume that uh, some message was sent to them in some form, <laughs> but that may not be correct. Um, here's what. Uh, here's again a missile defense agency. Uh, slide showing you the small footprint of the actual uh, interceptors, the 10 interceptors that they would be putting in in, um, in Poland. And of course, they're saying only 10 interceptors. But we know, we know by their logic that the system has to be expandable, though they claim inconsistent with their own logic that it won't be. So what, what kind of footprint would this have? Well, here's a 100 interceptor deployment. Uh, projected over the capital grounds. So it's not small, but the deployment area is not vast and, and uh, of vast size. So it would be interesting to know in the negotiations with Poland uh, what provisions, I, I, my guess is that uh, uh, it's all uh, very closely held information at this point, what provisions there are for additional grounds uh, to expand the interceptor farm because Again, if you believe the claims made by the Missile Defense Agency, there has to be plans to expand the missile defense farm. All right, let me go through some major findings, and I'll probably have to end there uh, because of uh, I'm supposed to end at 5.30, I assume. Uh, yeah, when people start shouting and walking out of the... <laughs> right, yeah, so... Um, let me just give you some of the major findings um, that we so far have. Uh, the European uh, mid-course radar just cannot perform the function that the Missile Defense Agency has claimed for it. Uh, and um, we don't know, but this strongly suggests that the radar is being replaced, being placed in the Czech Republic to get a footprint on the ground, to get a fact on the ground, uh, which will then be modernized. There can be, I, I know of no other, I mean, you'd have to assume that the people who built the radar uh, are totally incompetent, don't even know the performance characteristics of their own radar. So that is very unlikely to be the situation. Um, so somewhere up the line, somebody decided to tell a different story about the capabilities of this radar. And I hope the Congress will investigate this. Um, major finding two is that the, uh, if this missile defense is going to perform as claimed by or as expected or, or conceived uh, by the Missile Defense Agency, it must be upgraded. In other words, you have no choice but to upgrade it. And the reason for that is that when you look at the original plans for uh, the missile defense system, so this is, you know, I'm one of these guys who saves everything. So you tell me something 15 years ago, I'd take out the slide and show it to you. Uh, and here's a slide. Uh, it's been modified by me just to emphasize uh, details that shows what the Missile Defense Agency was claiming was going to be a, the, the second tier, the second uh, uh, move in their deployment, the second piece of their deployment. Uh, every early warning radar, like a Thule, was going to have an X-band radar associated with it. Uh, Filing Dale's radar is going to have an X-band radar associated with it. Now, of course, it's in the Czech Republic. Uh, the Cape Cod radar, uh, the radar in North Dakota, the radar at Beale Air Force Base, at Greeley Air Force, all of these radars have X, these early warning, these low frequency early warning radars have X-band radars associated with them. Now, the reason for this is because you have to have an X-band radar in order to tell the difference between the one foot strand of wire and the, and the three meter long uh, warhead. If you don't do that, 
uh, the system will have millions of targets to shoot at, and, uh, or hundreds of thousands of targets. Uh, and of course, you'll have no chance of, or very little chance of selecting the right target. Just to give you a feel for the situation, what you have here is a trajectory down to, this is the same trajectory I showed you earlier, but from a different perspective. And it's overflying the radar and, um, and landing in Washington. And you can see that this radar, if it had the range, would potentially be able to provide you discrimination information that could be used by the Thule radar, uh, as well as the uh, uh, Filingsdale radar, which is under here, uh, and the Cape Cod radar. So this would provide discrimination services for all three of these radars, rather than having independent X-band radars for, for, for these other radars. So you must do this, again, if you're going to do what you claim will, is your system. Uh, this is just another uh, uh, figure, same trajectory, but from a different perspective to show uh, the point that Frank had raised earlier, that if the radar doesn't have uh, a substantial range of well over a thousand kilometers, in fact, well over a thousand kilometers range against the targets of interest. Uh, even if it's directly flown at, it's, uh, the, as far as the United States is concerned, uh, there's going to be no performance uh, value to the radar. It's just essentially uh, uh, a giant paperweight in, in, the, in the Czech Republic. Uh, if the radar, if the trajectory is instead attacking the radar itself, which you can expect if you have an adversary who has the capability to build these things. Um, the radar will not even be able to see objects early enough that the interceptors could be launched to defend itself. It just will not even be able to defend itself uh, as a target in Europe. All right, so where is the radar for this system? Is there a radar somewhere that can do this job? There is. Uh, there's a radar in Europe that at Vardo, Norway, um, I got thrown out, uh, I got disinvited to a meeting, uh, uh, in, in a pug wash meeting in, uh, in Norway, uh, because I was involved uh, in, in, in 1998 to 1999 uh, with some Norwegian journalists explaining to them what the purpose of this radar was. They called me up, I looked at the radar, I looked up some of the physical properties because it was known. I said, oh, it's an intelligence gathering radar. What? Uh, it, was, it was described to the, by the Minister of Defense to the Norwegian Parliament to be for space track. I said, well, it can do space track, but you'd never put it in that location for space tracking. You put it in the location because it's an intelligence radar. Then there's a windstorm comes up, and the top, uh, this radar is a, is a dish, giant dish antenna, it's 27 meter diameter antenna gigantic, and uh, the windstorm tore, uh, tore the top uh, of the, um, the protective cover off the radar, and it's pointing toward Russia, where I said it was going to be <laughs> pointing, <laughs> which of course caused the uh, Norwegian press to go even more berserk, and the net result is the Norwegian government was in trouble for a whole bunch of things, but this contributed to the Norwegian government falling. <laughs> and I had been invited to give this talk in Norway before this happened, and I was disinvited afterwards. So, <laughs> so I've still never been to Norway. But there's this radar in Vardo, uh, at Vardo, Norway, that can potentially do the initial job of discrimination because it's so big, has so much power uh, and range. And uh, here's, here's the actual radar scaled to the, um, so, so this is a gigantic radar. There's the six foot man, there's the radar. So there's a six foot man on that radar. Gigantic radar, very powerful, built for intelligence gathering. But when you look at the, its, its potential coverage uh, and you calculate what it can do, not fiction, against uh, you know, a target that's characteristic of a warhead at X-band, uh, it could potentially perform discrimination functions working closely with the Filingdale's radar. And here's, here's just another picture of the fans to give you a sense of trajectories. So the question comes up, is there a secret plan that has not yet been revealed to use the Vardo radar? We know they lied about the Vardo radar once to their own parliament. And, um, and uh, I don't know the answer to that, but um, uh, it's the only way, it's the only way this system can function is by using the Vardo radar. I'm sorry? 
Are you, tell me, shut, uh, shut up. <laughs> um, okay, uh, the final finding, which I, I, I'll stop after because of, I think it's probably a good time to stop, uh, has to do with this national intelligence estimate, which could be a good, interesting several hours talk because uh, we've done a lot of analysis on this. Basically, what the national intelligence estimate says, let me just strip away all the smoke and mirrors. What the national intelligence estimate says is that the first time an adversary, whoever that adversary is, this primitive adversary that's been postulated by the missile defense advocates, flies an ICBM, it's going to be accompanied with countermeasures that will render the system, the missile defense, obsolete. Now, uh, let me just give you, since I've been in the system, in the, in the defense system, I worked uh, in the Pentagon, uh, let me just give you an analogy for this because people who are not immersed in this field, understandably, you know, might not uh, understand the context of how serious this omission is. Imagine we were in the Cold War again, and we were in a true serious struggle. You can argue whether it was or not, but let's just imagine it was. And, um, and the Soviet Union, uh, I was, you know, we were, we were all involved in an intelligence assessment. We're a team. We, we have technical skills of different kinds. We're coordinating all of our analysis. And we reached the conclusion, us, this intelligence team, that this new Soviet tank uh, has modernized armor that is going to make it uh, make us make make essentially all of U.S. anti-tank weapons uh, unusable against it. I'm just postulating this, and so we write up the national intelligence estimate for the senior people in our government, the Congress, the President, uh, and we omit this fact. We just don't tell them about it. We say there's this new tank. It goes this fast. It's got this gun on it. We like it. It's colored nicely. Whatever. But, uh, but we don't tell them that we have an internal assessment that indicates that a major military capability we need to be able to deal with these potential uh, forces, this potential machine, uh, have been rendered obsolete, and we need a new program to offset that. We just don't tell anybody about it. That's what's going on here with this national intelligence estimate. The CIA told the Congress in 1999 that anybody who fly, they may not be right, but it's, their, it's the national intelligence finding that if we see an ICBM coming out of Iran in 2015, as alleged by the Missile Defense Agency, it's going to have the capability to use countermeasures that will render our systems, our defense system obsolete. Why, since the Bush administration has taken office, has this dropped out of the national intelligence estimates on yeah. ballistic missiles? Is this an annual intelligence uh, It's not clear it's annual, but there, there are uh, discussion, there are discussions of uh, foreign developments in ballistic missiles. They dropped it. And it's just no longer in any of them. We've been looking for it. And I've talked to Dick Arwin about it. You know, he's big into the intelligence community. He's furious about it. Um, and right, properly so, I am. So, um, so this, we don't know why this happened or what is happening, but there, given our recent experience with tampering with intelligence findings for political ends, uh, one has to at least raise the possibility that there might be some very serious tampering that's gone on here with regard to missile defense. After all, if the president has made the deployment of this missile defense components in Europe one of the important pieces of his legacy, as he has stated openly, and these, th this stuff has disappeared from intelligence estimates. Uh, we know that there was manipulation, however one wants to restate it. There was manipulation of the intelligence with regard to Iraq. Uh, this is a small thing relative to a war of choice that we, we now, know, or, or, now don't know how to get out of. So. Um, so I'm hoping that this will uh, get some attention in the next uh, six months to a year uh, by the Congress, and we'll find out. We'll call. It turns out the man who delivered it, this guy Walpole, he's still around. He's still the National Intelligence Officer. 
he should have his day in court, and we should uh, look for, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing why this happened or how this happened. I'll stop here and take questions. Insults are allowed, so. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, the system, uh, the missile field in Poland, is advertised as ten interceptors, but that it might be upgraded later. Yeah, what they say, what they say is the, they, here's the here's the statement. Yep. You know, listen to these guys. You have to. It's like listening to a slippery, crooked lawyer. Um, we have no plans to modernize the system in any way for the next five years. Okay. That's what he's telling. That's what Mr. General Obering is telling the European allies. Right. So it's going to take five years to get these components in anyway. Right. So when they do upgrade that system, do you have any idea what that's going to look like? Because 10 interceptors right now isn't really a strategic threat to right. Russia. But if they do upgrade, is it going to upset the strategic balance? And if it is going to upset the balance, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Well, you know, all of these things, uh, we're getting, uh, I'm sorry to do this, uh, but I'll, I'll let me try to, we need a little psychology here or uh, social science uh, I need to inject. It's not just simply a technical matter. When the military planner looks at this, imagine we're military planners, you and I are military planners, and we have ICBMs that are going to fly toward Russia, and it turns out that an ally of Russia is Canada. All right, just, you know, let's, we're just trying to invent so we can see it from a, our own visceral perspective. And uh, the Canadians agree to allow the Russians to put an interceptor site with a large radar uh, in Canada. And it's only 10 interceptors. Well, we have thousands of ballistic missiles, so that's no big deal. But we look at this thing and we say, uh, the president has a national security directive. I think it's uh, President's PNSD 23. Um, the directive says the missile defense, missile defenses will be deployed as soon as possible. Whenever upgrades are possible, both technological and in terms of expanding the size of it, we will be doing it, and we will continue this program indefinitely. That's the presidential guidance. That's published. You can go look it up on the web for the White House. So you look at this and you say, Maybe this is the leading edge of something that's potentially big. Then, of course, if you don't, you say to yourself, what does this adversary think they're doing? It looks, I mean, I know that this system has very little capability of working when I look at it as a military technical person. But then I say, what does this other guy think that they're doing this? What, what kind of, do they believe that they can gain some advantage? And if they believe that they can gain some advantage, do they have the same assessment of risk and benefit about how these nuclear weapons could get out of control that I have? You know, do they have th this, this? I mean, I did this in the Pentagon. I'm, I'm very skeptical. It's got to be clear to you that I'm very skeptical about missile defense. I look very closely at the Galash ABM system, this uh, dog of a missile defense around Moscow. And although I knew then, as I do now, that it had almost no capability, in fact, it essentially had no capability. My first question was, why would you pour all this national treasure into this dog of a system? What are the political decision makers, what, what belief system do the political decision makers hold that causes them to do this? Is it simply bureaucratic politics? Or is it something more serious and deeper that's telling me they don't have the same risk aversion to fooling around with nuclear weapons that I have and that I think they should have? So once you start on this path, you open the door to all kinds of problems. Plus, of course, uh, there is the possibility, you know, w again, when you think about nuclear war from a military perspective, it's a little, it is crazy. It's not, it's a, it doesn't look crazy. It is crazy. Uh, people think about you attack the other guy's forces, reduce their capabilities, and then maybe you use the defense to pick up stray things. So maybe it's 500 interceptors 20 years from now. You can take out a very large part of our force and use the interceptors to deal with other things. Yes, sir. Professor, the, the reciprocal of your last point on the geopolitical implications, yeah. doesn't that indicate that the Russians have the overarching objective to be able to, uh, to, to, be able to destroy us at will? 
Um, yeah, I think, uh, but it, it's it, it's not necessarily they get up in the morning and they say, this is the day we're going after the Americans. They want us to know that if we try to destroy them or attack them, uh, the consequences will be unacceptable for us. Just as we, we don't plan to, to attack uh, Russia today, but we're not willing to give up our nuclear weapons. We want the Russians to know, even though they're supposed to be our friends, according to the president, that if they mess with us in a serious enough way and attack us, we could, we might and could respond with nuclear weapons. So it's not necessarily that they, you know, they want to get up one morning and say, uh, we want to destroy the United States. But if they see it as fundamental to them maintaining some political autonomy, not, not only survival, but to be free of not being coerced politically. Right? If they don't have nuclear weapons, I say, how do you know, uh, Mr. Putin, that we're not going to just drop something on you if you're not cooperative? Now, Mr. Putin may be pretty clear in his own mind that we're not going to do that. But would you play that game? I mean, would you, if it was your country and your people, would you just ignore this veiled threat? So they, it's reasonable. I mean, it's not good. <laughs> I'm not arguing it's good. But it's understandable why they would want to maintain a retaliatory capability, just as we would want to do it. So you're right. There's lots of ways to look at it. But it does, it's double-edged, for sure. Yes, sir. I guess my question was uh, the, the technical you know, failures of the radar. I think that makes sense to me. But from the standpoint of ten interceptors, and I, I mean, I'm almost, I must question like if there are how far they need to expand it. I mean, that seems to um, be more applicable to maybe a non-state actor acquiring uh, control of an ICBM, kind of the rogue commander theory. Um, and it seems like. You know, this would make sense. Ten interceptors. Um, I mean, and your 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 uh, your comment on how uh, Iran is going to, you know, um, have an assembly line of ICBMs that makes sense. But at the same time, I mean, Iran has to be conceivably deterred by our uh, nuclear capabilities. They're not going to launch a full strike. I mean, aren't we really more worried about a rogue commander launching one missile? Two well, I, again, you know. Uh we're talking about very theoretical things, so let me just caveat my, uh, you know, my statement before I respond. But even when we're talking about very theoretical things, we still have to try to make judgments about what is plausible relative to other. You know, there's a range of possibilities you can imagine. I mean, the enemy could take over. You know, uh, uh, who's the guy Seagal? This uh, this the guy who does all these action films that take over the battleship Missouri and steam into our port and shell us or something. Uh, you know, we have to, you, you know, if you're, there's a lots of possibilities that uh, might not be predicted. But if you had to sit down and do as most, the most rational estimate of the problem that, you know, you can put together, your first concern would be if someone obtains a nuclear weapon. Seems to, because that's the fundamental the, the nuclear weapon is the fundamental problem. Then your concern would be, what's the nature of the nuclear weapon? Is it some 10,000-pound primitive thing that's movable but not easy to move? Or is it a 50-pound advanced nuclear weapon that's very light and compact? Because that makes a big difference. Then who's got it? Are they, uh, are they willing to carry it into your country uh, on a ship or a plane? Or, you know, because that's, those are possibilities. Just go across the border with it. Um, uh, if they want to deliver it in other ways, um, uh, the technology required to build a small pilotless aircraft or drone and deliver it by that is relatively straightforward. If you're suicidal, you could even get a small uh, private airplane and fly it over your location and detonate it, bring it in in a truck and detonate it. So now, so you have all these possibilities. We can go on and on and on. Uh, now you're talking about a 200,000-pound um, ICBM that these guys are going to be hauling around with all the equipment. It's, it's, it's high, I would argue it's highly implausible that a non-state actor would pose this particular threat. And, in fact, the national intelligence estimates uh, agree with that. Now, you know, is it impossible, uh, you know, 
hard to know because, but it seems extremely unlikely because if, if they couldn't build it, that means they would have to obtain it from somebody. And most states that have these uh, systems are pretty careful about how they control them. So, I, you know, so, so you got all this money you're spending on this one uh, system for uh, a defense against a, a, a possibility where the other possibilities are much more plausible. Why would you be neglecting those other possibilities? Is it, do you understand what I'm? Yeah. Yes, sir. There were some suggestions in the European press several months ago that the genesis of all this did not come out of military planners, but rather lobbyists for the builders of this system. Have you seen evidence of that? Um, no, but I'm not, you know, I'm a technologist, so I'm uh, focused on different things. Here's my guess, and it's, it's been talked about, if you start looking back, there's lots of things that are talked about that never go anywhere. Uh, you can find statements, I think, as uh, certainly back to 2004 and possibly 2003, I'd have to, uh, where people were, you know, sort of testing the water on these things. My guess is um, uh, the president, uh, you know, some people in the Missile Defense Agency thought that this was a good idea. They're trying to get facts on the ground. Uh, I think that's what's going on. They're trying to get, you know, the idea is to put systems in that, you know, you're, you're negotiating a treaty with the Czech Republic. You're negotiating a treaty with Poland. So this, you know, it's not easy for an American president after that's been done to just pull out when all of these um, commitments have been made. And um, so uh, it seems to me, and I'm guessing because I, I don't have any additional insight. May, you know, your insight may be better than mine. Uh, what's going on here is they're trying to put something in place before the president leaves office that will be very difficult for a follow-on president, whoever that president may be, to reverse. That's my guess about what's going on. That's certainly, uh, I thought that about the interceptors initially when I started, you know, because I look at this as a technical person with a, policy uh, concern that drives my technical analysis. But then when we did this analysis on the radar, I look at it and say, for Christ's sake, this radar is a paperweight. It's just, it can't be there, you know, there, there is no doubt that people who are competent technically, not the missile defense director, because I don't think he's competent technically, but, but the system has got a lot of competent people in it. People who built this radar know what its capabilities are, you know, and I, so, somewhere along the line, it was seen as a political opportunity, is my guess. They didn't have a full-scale radar to put in because they're having a terrible time manufacturing these X-band transmit receive modules, which are very expensive, hard to manufacture, and you need hundreds of thousands of them to build a real radar. This radar's got 16,000 transmit receive modules. The radar you'd want to build would have 300,000 of these things. And they don't have them. I mean, it's been a big problem even, you know, even for the other construction. So how do we put a fact on the ground? I'm just thinking aloud. We put this fact on the ground to give us enough time to get these other things ready to put in later. That's what I think is going on, but I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, from a technical and strategic standpoint, is the choice of Czech, the Czech Republic and Poland for the geographical location significant? And if so, does it make the most sense? It's a good location. It's a good location if you want to use the X-band radar to provide discrimination services for the eastern two-thirds of the United States because the radars, these radars at Tule and Filingsdale and, um, and Cape Cod must have discrimination support. So it's a, it's a good location for that. And it's also a good location if you think that you want to have a hedge uh, to be able to take care of Russian ICBMs, engage Russian ICBMs. And that's the way it looks from a technical point of view, and that's the way the Russians seem to have interpreted it. You know, I, I don't know what the real reasons are. Yes, sir. You, you, I'm sorry. A couple of last questions. Yeah, sure. You stated that uh, the first uh, Iranian effort would disable the radar system. If the intelligence estimate is correct, if the okay. NIE finding is correct. So if it's that easy, why is there so much resistance? And furthermore, can you put a percentage on the possibility that you're wrong? 
and that, in fact, it would work? Well, I think the radar calculation could be wrong. I don't think it is. I've had a lot of people who know about, let's say, these technologies as well as me check it. Uh, um, I mean, you know. Uh, Why the resistance then, if it's so easily disableable, easy to knock? Oh, out? because it looks like it, lo it looks like the leading edge of something that's a lot bigger. I mean, yeah, I, but when the first missile from Iran takes out the radar, won't the first missile from Russia take out the radar, even a bigger radar? No, but the Russians, you know, <laughs> uh, well, I think I said, you know, it looks like the leading edge of something big, and the Russians are concerned about it. And frankly, if I were, you know, if I were the American looking at Canada with this system facing me, even though I don't think it's got much capability, I mean, look, we almost went to war over some, uh, we almost blew up the, a large part of the northern hemisphere over some dog missiles in Cuba, you know, in 1962. We didn't want to tolerate the Russians with a base in, 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 the, in, in the American sphere of influence. Why should the Russians be different in their reaction to this? I mean, you know, they, they have concerns for their security. I mean, you know, all you have to do is mirror. You, you don't have to get into politics. You don't have to get into the culture of Russia versus the United States. Just sit back and say to yourself, if, you know, create a mirror situation and ask yourself if you would tolerate it. Now, maybe you would. I don't know. But uh, I can tell you I wouldn't. You know, Frank would have to be putting a noose around me saying, Postal, cool down. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, because I would be, you know, I would, I would be in the Pentagon talking to my boss saying, you know, for, for, you know, if you ask my opinion, we should not let this happen because it's, the, it's a step in, it's a foot in the door, and that foot in the door is going to be very difficult to reverse. If we can stop the foot in the door, then it's going to be very difficult for these people to, to pull this off at some other time. That would be my advice to a political decision maker if I was asked. But my analysis would certainly be not changed because that's, that's me. Frank would surrender. He's a, you know, he's... <laughs>